In order to become a new person, you have to give some things up. If you look at life in general, it's either you're either growing or you're dying. I mean, mm -hmm. that's it. A lot of people are taking action and they want to get to a point where they're like content and they're good. Yeah. They don't realize owning a business and doing a thing. They have nothing to do with each other. Totally separate skill sets. No matter how much I try to do that could be great things, there's always going to be opposition. It okay. does not matter. There's really only two things that you need to do in order to have a totally different life. You need mm -hmm. new information. Mm -hmm. You need what up, Wealth Builders? Today, I got a doctor on the show, but we are not talking about health. In fact, we are talking about what it was like on his entrepreneurial journey of building a multi-million dollar medical practice, but all the mistakes that were made along the way, especially when it comes to trying to raise a family at a young age and build a business. And I know a bunch of you can relate to this because maybe you're just starting your business and you've got family or you're thinking about starting a family and you're like, how the heck am I going to balance all this stuff, man? We're not making any money yet. I still have to provide and I have to be a good dad or a good wife. Like, I don't know how to balance it. You guys know that for me in the wealthy way, that's my whole message. And I got this guy, Dr. Greg Persley on to talk about what not to do and how to fix it. What's up, man? Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah. So I met you. Um, well, I met you with Dave Meltzer initially, and then uh, you came to WealthCon yeah. on a diamond ticket and we were having dinner with Ed Milet and um, gotten to hear your story about your regenerative medicine practice and, you know, spending 15 years in chiropractor and, you know, all this stuff. But then, you know, we really got to connect because of the family side of things. Yeah. You know, I've got a special needs son. You've got special needs son. And, We've both gone through a lot of the same things. Yeah, it's hard to, you know, a lot of people can't really connect with that because they don't know what it is to be in that moment mm -hmm. um, where you are so con confused and, and what to do and, and, you know, where you're at as a father and a, and a family. And, you know, you have decisions to make. You're like, which way do I go? Which, where do I focus? Mm -hmm. and, it, and, you know, it's interesting because people make different decisions in those moments. Um, yeah. And, and we talked about a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, you, you yeah. were 25 when you had your son yep. and you were just starting your business. Yeah. I think a lot of people listening right now are probably at a similar point in life. Maybe yeah. they're not 25, but maybe they're branching off from being, you know, W2 to just taking that risk and they got young kids. Yeah. Well, I was 23 when I graduated as a doctor. So I kind of always knew what I wanted to do. I was a chiropractor. I was young and, you know, full of vigor. I was like, I'm going to take over the world and be a multimillionaire by the time I was 30. <laughs> by the way, why do people ever want to be chiropractors? Like, how do you, how do you pick that profession of medical? Ever since I was a, a young kid, I, my mom would be like, here, take some Advil. And I'd be like, no, I don't want it. I mean, even when I was young, they talk about it. They were like, you would always ask for vitamins and stuff. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, but okay. when I was a junior in high school, we went to, and took a tour uh, of a chiropractic um, school. And I said, man, this is what I want to do. So luckily that's like one of the best things that ever happened to me because as a junior in high school, knowing exactly what I wanted to do, I went to undergrad, played a little baseball, didn't get drafted. I actually did the math on it and said, well, I'm more likely to go into grad school than to get drafted. <laughs> Probabilities. So, yeah. I really just did the math. <laughs> and, uh, so I went to grad school immediately. And, um, while I was in grad school, met my wife, had a daughter and then graduated. Cause I didn't think it was hard enough. Obviously I had to you know, make it harder by getting married and having a having kid kids, at the time. Yeah. Yep. Started a practice two years later, had our son, and then, you know. That's when life changed. Yeah, it, we, it literally changed 180 degrees, just flipped around, flipped around on us because we thought we knew the direction we were going. And this is talk, I talk a lot about resiliency because what happens, especially, and this relates to business too, what happens when you're moving in a direction and you think you know what's going on and you have everything lined out and then something happens that you had no control over and you were not predicting, then what? That's yeah. you, you got to be able to put uh, put <laughs> you got to put your mind in, in the right space and move in a, you know the right direction and and uh, and be able to be resilient. And so that's what we had to do. We just had to figure it out. Yeah. So. You have a daughter, young daughter, yeah. you have a son and. I mean, share with everyone what it was like um, with your son, because you shared it with me and how difficult it was. <clears throat> and I've talked about just the first year of being a dad and, you know, my son being in the NICU for two months yeah. and then having brain surgery, his first year of life, like, and all these delays and developmental stuff and uncertainty. It was, it was a really rough first year in my life. Uncertainty is what kills you. It's the, the fear of the future of all the what ifs. And you sit there and go through all of them. But I was 25. My practice was a couple of years old. It was growing and doing relatively well. Um, my daughter's two and a half and my wife's pregnant with our son and about to give birth. And so, you know, 
up until that point, it was a great pregnancy, you know, and nothing was awry. And uh, the day he was born, I'll never forget, I was sitting there holding him. And uh, my wife's here and my daughter's here and my family, extended family's over there. And, uh, you know, you're thinking about all the future of your kid. Like, this is awesome. You know, I'm, we're going to do all this stuff, play ball. And I'm going to teach him things and whatever. And and then all of a sudden the doctor bursts in the room and literally like burst in the room it, with that panic look like, I got to talk. And she, she said, I'm going to need the extended family to leave and I need to talk to the parents. And even my dad turned to me and goes, you know, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. So they left and then they informed us, Hey, uh, we are almost hundred percent certain your son was born with dwarfism. No ran, you know, no family history. It was right. totally random, unprepared for it. And so all of our, you know, thoughts for the future immediately turned into questions. Right. What does this mean? Is he going to have a normal life? How did this happen? What did we do? You internalize it. What, what did I do wrong? And we thought that was going to be kind of like, oh, okay, we'll get, we'll get through that. We'll figure out that stuff and then we'll move on. But then he ended up having a lot of medical issues over the first year. Um, and that was the beginning of, you know, a very trying time uh, mentally, emotionally, physically, chemically, like financially relationships, everything you can imagine having stress for the next almost eight years. That's the way it was. Mm. Um, you know, like, I it, it's still emotional, even though, you know, he's almost 16 now, but you take yourself back to the moment and, and I shared with you and I'm totally fine with sharing people, it, you know, we had to revive him a couple times, you know, like at home. Yeah. Uh, one time it was a Chuck E. Cheese. He lost oxygen, passed out and <laughs> yeah. had a Chuck E. Cheese. You're like, what is going on? So you, you try to take this kid and I, you know, <laughs> you try to raise him as normal as you can, but there was just a lot of unknowns. Um, and you, we really felt alone for a long time. Long story short though, three months old, he started requiring oxygen. You know, he's having trouble breathing. We really didn't know which type of dwarfism he had. He had, there's over 200 types, six months old. He started getting pneumonias a lot. So he was spending a lot of time at children's hospital, which was two hours away from our home. And our daughter was three and a half at the time. She's getting passed around to family members, which are two hours away. And it was just, a, and, and I was the only income. <laughs> yeah. So it was a chaotic time. And then at nine months old, he had a, a major event where he spent three months in the hospital and he ended up getting a trach and event to help him breathe. So we came home after his first birthday, which we celebrated at the hospital. He's in a trach. He has a vent, hundred percent oxygen. Like if he was disconnected from the vent, you had 15 seconds. Wow. Otherwise he was passing out. That's how fragile he was. And so for, multiple years, two to three years, one of my wife and I, one of us was within six feet of him at all times. Yeah. Just because of that tube falls out. Yeah. So you think about, you know, <laughs> it's a lot. Of, I mean, I can just tell you like, um, yeah. the stress is very difficult. Um, you know, cause my son, even I remember he was on oxygen for two months in the NICU and they're like, all right, he's good. And I'm like, are you sure he's good? Cause like, what if he's not? Yeah. Like, what if something happens while we're sleeping, you know, like the, the stress and the anxiety of that, man, it's a lot. Yeah. And you know, people like to compare, which I, I try not to compare to anything. I, I think comparison is the thief of all joy. I really do. I just, you know, as a parent, you're put into a situation and you just do the best you can with what you've got. You're not prepared. It, it, no, you're not prepared as a parent anyway. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, I'll never forget when we brought my daughter home after yeah. two and a half days in the hospital after having her. And they're like, all right, go home. I'm like, I was 23. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about anything. Are you sure I can like, take, I can just take yeah. this kid home? Yeah. 22, 23. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was an interesting ride home. I was excited. Uh, you know, becoming a dad is a, is a, just an amazing experience. And I was all excited, like, oh, we're going to play games and have fun and, and do all this stuff. I'm going to teach you everything. And then you get home and they just like lay there and cry. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> you're like, can we play do and do something? Uh, yeah. Anyway, you're like, oh, this is, this comes down the road. Okay. Yeah. 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 Five to 10 years down the road, <laughs> we'll be able to do stuff. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a complete 180. So it changed it, it. We, I talked to you a little bit about this in your book, which I really loved you know, you're reading your book. It Thank really you. touched me as you opened it up so well too, by the way, uh, with just that it's such an emotional story, which I could totally relate to. But, um, you know, you went, when, when everything was going on with your son, you said, look, 
I'm going to put my priorities straight and I'm going to be home as much as I can and focus on the family. Mm -hmm. And I did the direct opposite. I went, I've got to make as much money as I possibly can as quick as possible so that I can provide for the family so I can pull myself out later on. Mm -hmm. And that turned into almost a decade. Let's pause real quick. We just launched something new that I'm really excited about, which is our text hotline. It is now easier than ever to get in touch with myself and my team. If you've ever been thinking about working with us in any way, whether it's through real estate investing, learning how to create content or scaling your business, we want to help you out. And it's super simple. All you got to do is just text 725-444-5244. If you text that number, my team is going to get in touch with you right away. And I, in fact, might be responding to some of those texts as we get the system just built out and rolling. We can answer any of your questions for getting you help, telling you about our different programs, different events we've got coming up, different resources that we have that can help you. It's going to be epic. So just text us at 725-444-5244 and somebody will respond to you and get you help right now. To be fair, we had two different situations at that point. Yeah. You know, you were just starting your business, you know, two kids, uh, you know, a lot going on. At that point, I had an established business. I was already a millionaire. And yeah, my business had a lot of things going on that year and we were scaling and I had employees and a lot of responsibilities, but still, you know, I'm like, all right, my wife needs me more than these, you know, my employees need me. Right. And so I made that choice to start working from home on Wednesdays to, you know, be certain I was home by five and, you know, just really be there emotionally for her. Um, because I think she also had a lot of the experiences you were saying of like, blaming herself. Like what, what did I do during this pregnancy that could have caused this? What could I have done better? And so I had to be there to say, no, like none of this is your fault. Like, you know, we're going to get through this and everything's going to be just fine. And God gave us this, this amazing boy because we were equipped to be able to handle it, you know, not the other way around. Right. Yeah. And so, um, that, that was how I leaned, but I, I do want to hear your side because so many people are dealing with maybe not as extreme as what you had to deal with, but dude, I got three kids and I'm trying to start my business and yeah. we're a young family. And I just, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm lost. I'm overwhelmed. Like I want to succeed and provide and be there for my family, but I feel like I have to be doing all these things in the 80 hour weeks for that to actually happen. Yeah. There's a really good story that I heard about that where I think it was uh, my buddy Dan Martell. Love, love Dan. Yep. And uh, he was telling Speaking of the next wealth con, by the way. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's going to be there. I'm so excited about that too. Um, so he tells this story about working with um, one of his students, somebody he coaches. And I'm going to paraphrase it. I'm probably going to botch it. Dan, please, you know, don't, don't, <laughs> uh, mess, don't uh, message me. Um, but basically the guy said, yeah, I went home and I messed up in business and I went home and I told my wife, look, I'm going to uh, buckle down for the next couple of years. You're not going to see me. Uh, the kids are going to, you know, you, I need you to take care of the kids. I need you to take care of the house because I got to get this fixed. And it, I think it's going to take about two years. And Dan's response was like, look, they didn't ask you to do that. Mm. Like he's, he's like, the, the student was going, I'm doing this for my family. And Dan's like, that, but they didn't ask you to do that. Yeah. And you have to, I've learned this now and it literally took me almost 15 years to learn it. I've been, I've been married almost 20 years. So the last four or five years, my marriage has been amazing. My wife and I are on the same page, but it took me the first 15 years to realize that you have to work together and have a dual vision and just be very transparent about what's going on. Right. Um, because if you think that you have to handle it all, that that's not the way it goes. And that's where I, I, that's the way I took it. I have to handle it. All. I have to be the man of the house. I have to stay strong. And then I would have breakdowns occasionally, like yeah. just, it was too much. And then she'd be like, you know, I hate to say this, but it makes me feel human that you're breaking down right now because you seem like Superman. Mm. And I like my, <laughs> my wife even told me not that long ago, she said, you know, your daughter thinks you're Superman. Mm. I'm like, man, you know, cause that's not what I thought of me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so having that communication and being on that same page, my wife has a great statement. She's like, look, if you're not on the same page, show them your page. 
Mm. If you're not on the same page, show them your page. Mm. It's simple. Communicate. Here's, here's what I would like to do for us. Here's what you would like to do for us. Here's what we are trying to grow together. Now we can move forward as a unit. Yeah, I think that's important. And my wife and I actually did that about a year ago. And it's funny because like uh, in business, you have these same page meetings where you're like, hey, let's just get on the same page and, and chat for 10 minutes to make sure we're both like clear yeah. on what we're trying to do. So it's normal for us in business to communicate and get on the same page. Yet with our spouse, it's it. I don't know. It can be awkward. Even for my my wife and I, we're, we've been married over 10 years now. And, um, you know, nobody ever wants to hear, hey, we need to talk. You know, yeah, right. yeah. like that's yeah. usually <laughs> like, oh boy, <laughs> the way you approach that. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Uh, we need to talk to you. Yeah, hey, we, I think we need to have a same page meeting. You're like, oh crap, here we go. Yeah. Right now we don't necessarily do that, but you know, if it's not a normal thing in your marriage or your business, then yeah, you, you perceive it as being like, oh crap, dude, what did we do now? But if it did become a normal thing in your life and your marriage and it's like, Hey, on Sunday, let's just have a quick same page, make sure we're aligned on the week and what we got to yeah. do. Well, then you're going to have a lot more um, better communication and like you're not going to have this skewed vision of what you think they want. And they think this is what, you know, you're trying to do. And you guys are not even close to being on the same page. Well, yeah, that's that's assumptions. You know, assumptions are <laughs> they kill yeah. you because you're just assuming, oh, this is what they want. But um, it, it's you have to be more, you're more vulnerable in in that relationship. You know, mm -hmm. because at work you can have a, Hey, let's talk. And let's, it's very surface level sometimes. And yeah. it's like, we need to hit these numbers and we hit the KPIs and we need to do these things. And, um, and if they ask a question, you know, that's hard hitting or deep, uh, you know, you can, you don't have to really answer that. I mean, but at, at home mm -hmm. with your spouse, you know, it's, you're, you're there and you're always there. In fact, my wife always jokes cause she goes, I, I have to remind myself sometimes that you're a doctor because, you know, you're standing there in the fridge like, where's the mustard? And <laughs> she's like, it's right there. Second shelf, third one on the right. I'm like, how in the heck did you know that? It's amazing. Yeah. Um, but it's just a vulnerable position. And I think a lot of people still, even in marriage, put up a pretty good wall. Yeah. Um, and unless you work on ch chipping that wall down, tearing it down brick by brick by communicating and, and really working together, you, it yeah. will never happen. The thing is, this is my advice to married couples now being in the game. I, I can give some advice now, now that I'm 10 years in, um, you know, you change a lot in 10 years. My wife and I are very different people 10 years later. I mean, we met when she was 18. I was 22. So and neither of you knew who you were yet. Really. No, I mean, <laughs> I was, a, I just got drafted. I thought I was getting to the big leagues and I'm the man. And she just got into college. She thought she was going to go have some fun for four years. And I'm like, no, we're actually going to get married really quick. <laughs> um, so how, how long, uh, how long was it when you guys met to when you got married? Uh, so we met, we dated for a year. We got engaged and then um, we were engaged for a year and got married. Awesome. But we, it would all happen quicker. But during that year, those two years I was playing baseball. So I would leave for six months, yeah. come back, got engaged, leave for six months, came back, got married. So I bet you it would have probably all happened within a year had baseball not been mixed in. That had to be interesting getting back in with the teammates when you got engaged, you know, they're probably razzing the crap out of you. Oh yeah. yeah. No, that's pretty typical. I mean, like, you know, I'm around back, man, back then. Yeah. I mean, I was around older guys. A lot were already married. They had kids. And so like, you know, pretty normal. But, um, what I would say is, you know, being 10 years apart uh, or 10 years of marriage now, you know, our goals have changed as a family dramatically. You know, now she aspires to be, you know, the best mother she can be. We have three kids. She's aspire. Now she's stepping out into, you know, the limelight and the stage of trying to help other moms of entrepreneurs. And like, she's bold with her faith. She's playing the keys on the worship team for you know, wealth con like she's really stepping into that. That wasn't a thing five years ago or yeah. 10 years ago, dude, I didn't dream to speak on stages and like do business conferences and have a podcast. That was like never going to be a thing. So, you know, we, we have these different things now. And so it's like, one thing is clear. And you said this already, you know, you got to make sure that your visions aren't separated. You need an aligned vision. And so as our life changes, financially or with fame or mm -hmm. a negative thing, right? If something dr catastrophic happens, you know, we need to realign and say, okay, what are we going to do now with this 
circumstance, this new opportunity, this this uh, setback, whatever, whether it's good or bad, we need to realign to make sure we know how we're going to handle this. Yeah, that's so true. And it's it's not easy. It takes takes effort, takes work. And I think, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know what the divorce stats are today or whatever, but I think a lot of people just get into relationships and they're like, oh, if I don't, you know, if it's hard, I can get out of it. Yeah. And I'm looking at, you know, going like, when we got married, I go, look, we're in this, you know, we always joke. We're like, man, man somebody's got to die. Yeah. Like, that's it. If I don't like you, if yeah, we, like, this isn't working like, out. Somebody's got to die here. So uh, I always said I want to be married for 50 years. And, and, I, and my dad, he's he's hilarious. He Anyway, he he, um, he became a Southern Baptist preacher after I graduated college. I think I pushed him to it um, through <laughs> high school. There you go. Um, but he, you know, he's like, you know, the secret to marriage is pretty simple. Stay married and stay alive. There <laughs> you you go. just got to, you know, if you want to hit 50 years, stay married, stay alive. But, you know, it just takes effort. It, it's intentional. Yeah. Um, and occasionally you do have to have those sit downs, but you know, I'm no marriage expert because I've just been through a lot. So, you know, after going through all this and then, you know, our son started to get better, um, and then he got worse and then he started to get better again, which was a roller coaster ride. But after he was about eight and a half years old, he, he got better to where he could get the trach and the vent out. So now we're looking at a, at a family that we'd been focused on keeping him alive and keeping our family together. Now we're like realign of now we got to restructure our, what are we going to do for finances? What are we going to do for our business? What are we going to do? I mean, I had kept it going for a decade, but it wasn't like where I knew it could be. So tell me about that decade of, you know, dealing with obviously raising a young family. You end up having another kid too, right? I have two kids, a a daughter, a daughter and a son. Okay. I thought you had a third after that now. Okay. So, um, with that, you know, you got the two kids and you're building this business. By the way, you, you go to school to learn, you know, being a chiropractor, which teaches you nothing about business. <laughs> so you're like, I'm going to just be a Cairo and do this stuff. And I'm just going to put my head down and work more hours. Was a lot of that because in your mindset, it was just, I mean, look, I get paid every time I crack someone's back. I just have to crack more backs. Yeah. It was kind of like that. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was, it was literally, and I had no skill set to, to know how to leverage my time, leverage right. my knowledge. I, I didn't have that skill set at all. Um, and that's when it came to a head at the end of 2018, when we could actually take a moment, take a breath, like, okay, we don't have to be scared and worried. Like I developed a habit of being, making business decisions, being worried and scared and fearful and anxious, which is no place to make business decisions. I was trying to make the quick, you know, the swing for the fences, right. Hit the home run. Um, and and that's not the way to do business. You should play business long term, really. Yeah, you can make short wins, but you don't constantly have short wins. Like when you do, when you flip real estate, yeah. you might have a, a quick win with, oh, he made this money, but yeah. you got to go do it again and create SOPs and and procedures around it to where it gets better and better as you go. Mm-hmm. And I didn't do that, man. It was like me and uh, two employees, and it was like, you know, I would say big things. I'm a visionary type person, but I didn't know how to back it up with the tactical side. Yeah. And so in 2018, I'm talking with my buddy and I'm like, man, I came down to this one question. It was like, can I keep doing what I'm doing the way I'm doing it for the rest of my career? Hmm. And the answer was absolutely not. There's no Hmm. way I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And even my wife said at that time, I'll never forget that. She goes, well, can't you just, you know, treat people five days a week and, and just, you know, make the money you're making. Now, we were bringing in a few hundred thousand dollars as a, as a unit, as a clinic, but we had so much overhead, overhead yeah. and debt that I was making? maybe bringing in 65 to 75,000 a year, maybe. Now, and was it was, your clinic or you were working there? No, it was mine. So yeah. you owned it, but you, you know, y- and you were mainly cracking all the backs too. Yeah. You'd have probably not made any money had you hired somebody else to crack the backs. Yeah. And I had tried a couple different partnerships and that sort of thing of yeah. bringing somebody in and, and trying to have them. So that I had a backup plan, but those didn't work because it wasn't aligned. I didn't realize that you had to have alignment. You actually had to hire. So I just thought that you could just hire people and they would just do what you wanted to do. And everything was going to be great. Like I didn't realize how complex a business actually was. And a lot of people do that. They get into business and they know how to do a thing, a photographer, a dentist, a chiropractor, or whatever. And because they know how to do this thing, they think, oh, I'll just turn it into a business because then I can own it and I can have my own hours and whatever. Yeah. They don't realize owning a business and doing a thing are two separate. They have nothing to do with each right, other. Two separate, totally separate skill sets. So then in 2018, I'm like, okay, I can't keep doing what I'm doing. What's the problem? I started to identify the problem. And the problem really was, is that I didn't have the skills I needed. And I really understood at that time that there's really only two things 
that you need to do or need to have in order to have a totally different life into the future. You need mm-hmm. new information mm-hmm. and you need new actions. Mm. It is that simple. New information, new actions, because new information turns into new beliefs. New beliefs turn into new thoughts. New thoughts turn into new emotions. New emotions turn into new actions. Guess what? Now you have habits of for a new life. Wealth Builders, I'm so excited to announce the launch of Wealthy University. This is literally the best deal we've ever created. Imagine if you got calls with me and my team every single week where you can ask Q&A and get up-to-date information on what's working in my business and for other experts in the world. On top of that, what if you got access to all of our courses? And what if you got access to exclusive softwares like our CRMs in our community to go and do deals and make relationships? Well, if that sounds like something you wanna be a part of, it's only $97 a month. I'm not kidding you. If you've joined any of our other programs, you know they're a lot more expensive than that. So to get access to our community for only $97 a month is absolutely insane, and it's so easy to sign up. All you gotta do is go to wealthyuniversity.com and you could sign up today and get instant access to those calls exclusive content like our WealthCon recordings or our workshop recordings and so many other things in the community. So go check out Wealthy University today and get signed up. So at that time, I was like, okay, so I need to go find somebody that is doing well. I just need to talk to them because I felt like I wasn't doing well. And so um, I t- called a buddy that was uh, business financially, you know, really well off. And so we talked for a while and he's like, man, you got to come to Grant Cardone's, you know, event next year. Now, Uncle G. Yeah, right. So now listen, <laughs> I, at 2018, at the end of 2018, I didn't have any money. Yeah. I mean, I was leveraged, basically. I, I had a business, but I was leveraged. I was cash poor. People real, don't realize that too. They think, oh, you're. I have a multi-million dollar clinic now. And they're like, yeah. oh, you must be just killing it. And I'm like, yeah. well, I mean, I always thought being a millionaire would feel different. <laughs> it's yeah. not like you have millions in the bank, you know, you you're leveraging things and doing business activities. But anyway, I tell people this all the time, by the way, of like, Hey, so you want to be a millionaire? Okay. Most millionaires, like you're still probably not balling out. So, you know, to really ball out, you better be worth at least 10 million to like yeah. truly ball out. And you can't have it all just tied up in real estate. Yeah. You need money to ball out. You need yeah. cash. I made so many mistakes that I had to learn about how to actually manage cash flow. And, you know, I'm still working out of some of the mistakes I made, you know, to to fix all that. But um, I now have the skill sets to do that, which is fantastic. So anyway, it's the end of 2018. My buddy's like, you got to come to Grant Cardone's Growth Con, you know, and um and so I'm like, dude, I don't think you heard me. I don't, I don't have any money. Like, I, don't, I don't understand. He's like, you got to buy a diamond ticket and sit up front with me. And, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, did you not hear me? I don't, I don't know. I don't have any money. Now this goes a lot into what I was saying in my head and what I was saying out loud. I kept repeating, like, I don't have the money. I don't have the money. I read one of his books and I was like, dude, I'm going. Which one was it? Um, I, I, I read his uh, real estate book actually. Okay. Cause that's the guy I was talking to was into real estate and I grew up on a farm and I worked construction for a while. And I, you know, so I kind of yeah. knew that. And I was like, okay, I, I, I kind of like this guy. Then I listened to a book on tape and I freaking, I was, I was just laughing. I remember yeah. mowing the yard laughing because this guy sounds like he's from Louisiana, just yeah. freaking whatever doing his thing. And so I decided, I said, I'm going to growth con. Yeah. I'm going like, I'm going to work on me. I, I just knew. Yeah, like, I'll figure out how to make it happen. Right. And what's interesting about that's where I really learned about faith. This mm-hmm. is where I, this was the moment because I set a goal. Okay. And, and I talk about the five A's of actualization to bring into your reality. The first one is aim, set a target, aim. And I, I said, that's my target. I'm, I'm aiming for this. I'm doing it. And I had so much conviction, faith that I was like, I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. Like I felt it in my soul. Like I knew, like I had to go to that thing. Two weeks later, Discover card sent me a $20,000, 0% interest finance um, uh, for 12 months yeah. uh, line of credit. You're like, I'd never seen that before. Never seen it since. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so this is, this is my sign. So this is where I learned about setting a goal and working toward it and then letting God, letting the universe do its thing to show me the resources or, you know, give me the resources to make it happen. And if you're not looking for those opportunities, you might just miss them, you know? Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I use that and there's a bunch of stories in here, but that was the moment where my mindset changed because I was always the guy that bought the cheapest ticket and tried to sell my way to the front through, you know, pleasantries, (laughs) you know, uh, smooch schmoozing people. Yep. 
But the moment I walked through those velvet ropes and they escorted me to the seat and I was three rows back and I was talking to people that had a billion dollars worth of real estate and I met some amazing people during during that time, that was the moment I realized the value, Mm -hmm. which is why I showed up last year at WealthCon. Yep. I was interviewing you and your team of like, do I want to do business with this guy? Mm -hmm. That's why I was here. Is he a real legit dude? Mm -hmm. Um, So all I can say is since that moment, in uh, at GrowthCon, I bought four programs in sales, leadership, um, building your your life, your resume, and I bought um, stages or how to speak from stage. And those four skills have totally been able to transform my life because I I took action, I kept taking action, and I grew and I grew. And since then, over the last five years, I am a absolutely completely different person, more confident, more you know uh, understanding about how business works. And it's gotten me into, into rooms like this. So yeah. that's what I, I tell people that all the time to, you know, aim for something that you believe is, you know, your purpose. And you may be wrong. You can change it later on. It's fine. Yeah. But that's, you well, got to have the, something. The part of aiming too that you're, you're describing is, you know, people could say, oh, well, I want to, um, right. You're, you know, we're using real estate as an example. I want to just be such a great real estate investor and I, I got my aim or, Hey, I want to, I don't know, play professional baseball for yeah. a kid. It's like, all right, well, you got to get in front of the people who are doing it. That's your point, right? right. Like you're not going to do it watching YouTube. Right. Right. Or even going to the event and sitting in the back, like going to the event and sitting in the back would definitely like, you'll get something out of it. Don't, it's not like it will be worthless, you know, and you, you might walk away inspired, but you're not going to get, to be with the people mm-hmm. that are actually so, what so you're that, trying to do. So that's step five. So okay, step, Got it. step one is aim. I'm jumping to the end. No, no, All you're right. good, man. Yeah, it's a good segue. Yeah. Uh, so step one is aim. This is just the things that I was like, this is what I did. These are the steps I took okay. that I, in retrospection, I looked and was like, well, how did that work? You know. And so I kept repeating the same th- five things. And I was like, oh, these are the five A's. So in order to bring something into your reality, you get, you've got a, um, you know, five A's of actualization. You got to have a target. You have to aim. Number two, you have to accept. Okay. Now this is the hard one for most people. You have to accept the fact that in order to move towards that target, you have to become a new person. Mm. And in order to become a new person, you have to give some things up. Some things have to change in your life and you may have to give up relationships or friends, or you may have to give up weekends or, um, you know, nights or, or alcohol or whatever. You, you're going to have to give some stump, something up to get to where you want to go and also accept yourself as a person for the life you've had and the experiences you've had up to this point. Cause so many people live in the past. They live back there and they just beat themselves up yeah. over and over and over. And that's not something you obviously want to do. You, you have to let that go and accept it. That's who I was. That's, this is where I'm at. I'm at. And if I want to move forward, I have to become a new person. The third step is you have to accentuate the things that you're doing that are moving you toward the target. Mm. You have to figure out what you're actually doing that's moving you towards and double down on those things. Yeah. Then you, number four, have to abandon the things that are moving you away. Mm. And it, But most people never sit and actually identify those things. They right. just get frustrated with it. I, uh, I want to be worth a million dollars. That's very vague. Why a million? You have to have a, a, a target that's more specific. And then you move through these. And then the fifth one is apply new actions. You have to apply new actions. You have to take those new actions and actually put them into getting around the people that you need to get around to learn about the thing you're trying to, you know, achieve in the first place. Mm. Um, and if you keep repeating those things, you start to realize that you're growing over time and other people start to realize it too. Yeah. So you have to overcome the two people that are going to, um, stop you in that process. That's yourself and everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your own mind of saying, you know, the doubts of fears, which is the first one. Yeah. And then the second one is the friends and family and people that don't understand the journey you're on and will try to stop you. Yeah, no, it's true. And then even with that, right. The other people, like first it starts out as people close to you in your circle today. And then as you get bigger, it, it turns into the competition, the haters, the everything else. And so that's what I've, I've, I've seen as this new stage of my life where, um, you know, no matter how much I try to do that could be great things, there's always going to be opposition. It yeah. does not matter. Yeah. It, <laughs> that's, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes, if not the biggest mistake I've made in my career. 
is I tried to go too fast with too little. So mm. tried to do too much with too little, almost at a anxiety pace. Like I was not in the flow. You know what I mean by that? Like in the, in the pocket, I was outside the pocket. I was pushing too hard with too little. Explain Instead that to of, people who don't know. Because this idea <laughs> of flow state is something um, people may have heard, but they don't understand. It just means being, have you ever heard a rapper try to go too fast outside of their abilities? Yeah. Or the beat or the or beat, whatever. And they, they, it just, it's not in cadence. It's messed up. It doesn't sound right. It doesn't feel right. And no one else around you is enjoying the process. Yeah. When, when, a, like when a rapper is in, in, in flow and I play guitar and I sing. So when I'm like playing guitar, there's a pocket that you can be in that is so in the, in the flow of the music of life, the cadence that when you get into that, things feel effortless mm -hmm. as opposed to effort. Like I have to keep pushing and keep trying. So when people talk a lot about like, uh, I've got to, you know, I've got to grind, rise and grind, like you really don't. And that's when I was like pushing so hard for some end that was never going to come. If you haven't heard, WealthCon is coming back to Las Vegas April 18th to the 20th, and I believe it's going to be our biggest one yet. We're going to try and fill the Caesars Palace with 2,000 top-level real estate investors and entrepreneurs. I've got amazing speakers like Neil Patel, Tim Grover, Dan Martell, Pace Morby, and many others coming, and it's going to be great. So if you want to get tickets today, we got some special deals going on. All you got to do is text me at 725 444 522 Four, four. We'll get you info on what kind of tickets we got all the way from general admission to our diamond level tickets where you're able to network with the speakers, go backstage, ask them questions, and then have a dinner with all of us in a really intimate setting. It's going to be great. So if you want to get tickets, text me at 725-444-5244. Mm. Well, I'll, I'll tell you guys my idea of flow state or as an athlete would call it being in the zone. Mm. Um, but I'm curious because to me, it sounds like for 10 years, you worked way harder than you have for the last five years, trying to grind against the flow and not go with it. Yeah. And you made the mistake of thinking, well, I mean, look, more hours equals more productivity. And I tell people this all the time. I actually just filmed a YouTube training. I don't know if it's going to come out before this or after this, but if it's, if it's before, I will link to it down below. <laughs> but this YouTube training I just talked about, I go, guys, I hate to tell you this. And I've told my employees this, I go, working hard is not the same thing as being productive. They are two different things. At the end of the day, would I take the guy who, you know, closed five deals in, in three hours or the guy who uh, worked for 10 hours and, and, and closed two deals? Yeah. I don't give a crap that you work 10 hours. That's great. You can you know, give me all the sympathy you want and say, dude, I mean, I worked so hard. Give me the guy who's in flow that just closed all of them because his skills there. He just understands his rhythm and his time. He also understands his capacity yeah. because he understands that, hey, I'm going to be in my zone of genius and absolute best only for this limited period. And I'm going to absolutely crush it. And then after that, I have to go out because I just can't. Mm -hmm. And that's how I operate. Yeah. And, and I, I can see that, which I love. And there's certain things that I like being around people like you because you can kind of emulate those things, which is why being in the room is so important and why being around people like, you know, being in the room is, is so important, but being around the people in the room, like at Wealth, you know, at WealthCon. Yeah. You, you know, I bought a, a diamond ticket. It was, it was the, the people that bought that. I'm now I'm friends with them and they're, they're all very, very successful, mm -hmm. you know, that was w worth way more than what I ever would have spent on the ticket. But yeah, just so but, everyone knows too, like what the diamond ticket is at WealthCon, you actually, that's the first time we ever did it. Oh yeah. So, you know, to, to give some cl context, uh, WealthCon, uh, we, we hold WealthCon every quarter and there's over a thousand people there and I get amazing speakers. It's a great experience with the parties and, you know, the networking and the content, everything's great. But for the first time ever, um, I paid for a speaker. So every one of my speakers to this point, I've had amazing people. They've just been friends. And like, I'm just fortunate that th they want to speak and they're willing to serve. Um, but I just decided when I was like, for us to get to the next level, I'm going to have to start 
getting these people who are really big that I don't have a relationship with yet, but they're people I want to build a relationship with. And so the first guy to do that was Ed Milet. And I said, all right, I'm going to pay Ed. I paid him six figures. And, um, you know, paying him six figures was way worth it in terms of not that we sold all these extra tickets or anything in terms of just knowing him now and the doors that um, he's opened for me and just the relationship that we have. I don't know what's going to happen the next 10 years yeah. being friends now, but it would have never happened if I didn't aim like you're saying and just go do it. Right. Yeah. And that was uncomfortable for me because I was already successful and I had a great event before that. I didn't need to do it. But I was like, I want to do it and I want to see what getting the next level looks like. So anyways, I came up with this idea. I said, well, dude, why do I got to be the only one that, um, you know, I guess pays for this slashes and enjoys it? Like, I bet you there's other people that would really like to spend some time with Ed and me and, and some of the other speakers. And so I did this diamond ticket level where I was like, you know what? I'm going to give them backstage access so that they can meet the speakers. I'm going to put them all together so they can network with each other. You know, these will be the, I mean, these people are paying $10,000 a ticket. Like let's have them, they're, they're going to do some stuff together. And then, uh, you know, at the end we'll have a, a dinner that's only for the diamond ticket holders. Mm -hmm. And there's very few of them. And, uh, you know, let's do it. Right. The tickets sold like freaking hotcake. I was like, Holy crap. Why didn't I do this before? I could have just had all these speakers, it wouldn't cost me anything, right? Yeah. And but, it's a great... Because you didn't know. Man. I didn't know. You, you just didn't know. It, I, it, it, it's it's <laughs> just, you have to become aware. And the only way you become aware is doing something and then going, well, how can we make it better? And, and that's another point that I wanted to make too, because, you know, a lot of people are taking action and they want to get to a point where they're like content and they're good. And I'm like, well, in, if you look at life in general, it's either, you're either growing or you're dying. I mean, mm -hmm. that's it. And so when you're, when you're talking about that, well, I, I didn't have to do that. Well, but you kind of did. Yeah. If I want to keep growing. Right. Because you, you got to get to the next level of whatever that is, because I think one of the biggest travesties in life is when people settle, they mm. just, they get to a point where they're like, eh, I'm good. Yeah. You know, but look at what some of the wealthiest people and some of the most impactful people like that could retire and not do anything. And those are the guys that do more than anybody else. And that's the only reason they continue to do right, a right. lot because they don't ever settle. Right. Why would you? Why not figure out what the next level is and, and how far you can go? Um, John Maxwell, he said, you know, I, I stopped asking, um, when am I going to get there? Yeah. And that's what I was asking myself. I was asking myself, like, when am I going to get there? When am I going to get there? When am I going to get there? If I put in this many hours, I should have this result. When am I going to get there? And he started asking, how far can I go? Mm. And the moment I started asking that, which I learned after buying his program in 2019 and started implementing it every day, um, the moment I started asking that, I started to say like, well, I can make a bigger impact if I think in terms of 5, 10, 15, 20 years yeah. as opposed to Right now. this second. Yeah. Right. And I'm glad you brought that up because I thought about this concept a lot too. Like even so, you know, we do the diamond dinner, right? it's very successful. All the attendees were like, bro, this was an amazing experience. I was like, wow, that's crazy that basically I got Ed for free and everybody is so excited that it happened. And then Ed also got to speak in front of a thousand people and like, just go lights out for everyone. Um, so then I did it again with Tim Tebow at this last one. And now I'm doing it again with Tim Grover and some others at this next one. And, um, it's just a thing I do now. I'm like, this is smart. Like freaking ever. Like, I can't believe it took me this long to and, figure this out. And you look like a genius, right? Yeah. So outside in, everybody's like, oh, you're a genius. And you're like, why did it take me so long to do this? <laughs> yeah. But you try it and you know, you do it. So anyways, um, I say all that because you actually brought up a good point of that. I actually did have no choice. I had to do it because I want to level up every event and keep refining, keep making it better and better and better. And the key here is this. At, at, at this point, I don't feel like I have grinded my way to get to this point. I, and I also don't feel like I rushed. Like people think that I'm moving at a fast pace, but I don't feel like that. I just feel like you said, I feel like I'm in flow and I'm just moving at my own pace. I don't work on the weekends. I don't, I'm golf. We're golfing tomorrow. Yeah. You know, like that's how I operate. And yet the speed is really fast and I don't know where it's going to be in 10 years. I wish I would have figured that out way earlier. I really do because um, it's it's a lot more 
like just inside yourself. It's a lot more calm. It's a lot more centered. It's a lot more, you know, content. And like my wife even tells me, she's like, you, you've been way more calm. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm not working towards some end that's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I like, what was I working towards? Like if I hit a certain amount of money, then I'm going to just be done. Like what, what was I, you know, I didn't yeah. even define it. Like I had no, I just was working and it was based out of fear and it was based out of anxiety of, of n- not thinking in long terms and not having the faith into the future. It was thinking now. And what I hope people are getting out of this is that if you, if you pay attention to your emotions and what you're feeling, anxiety, fear, worry, stress, whatever, or what you're talking about, which is content, joy. Um, uh, I mean, how would you describe some of the emotions that you feel on a regular basis? It's yeah, I would happiness, say content, it's peace. peace. Um, oh, peace is a great one. I, I would say peace is the main one because so many people are not at peace. Yeah. And not being at peace comes from a lot of things. For me, the first is just, I mean, look, if you don't have Jesus in your life, you'll never truly be at peace. That's my belief. Now, even if you have Jesus and you're trying to follow God and everything, you're still going to be, you know, facing opposition. (laughs) Opposition doesn't stop. You still have a career. You still have a job. You're going to have competition. You're going to have people who hate on you. You're going to have bad things happen. All that still comes into play. You just have a different weapon for how to battle it. Right. And that that's the main thing for me, because we're talking about faith and I would be a liar if I just said that, hey, having faith that it's going to be all good is going to be enough because it's not Mm -hmm. because you're just putting faith in either yourself or just like luck. Mm -hmm. You're like, yeah, I mean, I, I think it'll work itself out or I am good enough to solve this. I don't know, man. I'm not a believer in that. I'm that great. I really don't. I think that like. I've been given a lot of grace and a lot of opportunities and things that I didn't deserve and I didn't earn and that it just so happened. God decided to open the door. What you're really talking about is being grateful and appreciative for anything and everything that happens in life. Because if you really think about life, life is inherently meaningless. Yes. Which people mistake that. And I'm like, what I mean by that is we put the meaning into a situation and a really simple way of explaining that is you can have one experience from two different perspectives. One person enjoyed it. One person didn't. Mm -hmm. And so you're putting that meaning into that experience, which means that you have the opportunity to look at any experience and look at it from a completely different angle and change the meaning in it and, and say, Oh, well maybe there's a different way of looking at it. So therefore, um, I'm not the victim of that. Yeah. Like this is something I really love talking about in a private setting, but I'm going to talk about it with you. I think you'll really understand it, but there's really one thing. If you look at all the religious leaders, even Jesus, that they all agreed on Mm -hmm. was one thing. And that was you, you become what you think about. Mm. You become what you think about. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you really break that down, you go, okay, well, what do people normally think about? Well, there's really two things that you can think about. You can think about what you want or what you don't want. Think about that. Mm -hmm. You can focus on and think about what you want or what you don't want. One is a um, abundance mentality and one's a victim or, or a scarcity mentality. But most people focus on what they don't have, which is the opposite of gratitude and abundance and thankfulness and appreciation. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about looking at that piece, what you're saying is, look, I'm not having faith that everything's just going to work out hunky dory for me. I'm saying that no matter what, yeah, I am appreciative and grateful and thankful, yeah, that I'm able to be here and experience. Yeah, no, it makes me think of two Bible verses that I really believe, especially since this last year and a half for me was actually the toughest of my business career with high interest rates and everything yeah. in real estate you know, after just like killing it all these years, real estate was just crushing. Um, but you know, Romans eight 28, you know, just talks about that, you know, God works for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And in every situation he does this. And so that means good and bad. It's good for you. It does not matter. It's always for your good. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day for me, I'm just like, yeah, I mean this bad situation, high interest rates, it sucks, but you know what? I know that God's working it for my good. I'm becoming more resilient. I'm becoming better. 
and I know how to handle the situation. And then in James chapter one, he just starts off and he's like, rejoice through trials and tribulations because it is the testing of your perseverance that develops your faith. You know, at the Mm. end of the day, if you don't go through trials and tribulations, you cannot develop perseverance. You can't develop faith, you know? So how do you have faith when everything's good? You don't, you don't need faith. It's just like, yeah, dude, I'm rolling right now, Mm -hmm. but it's through the tough times that faith is really increased. Yeah. And that brings me to like, when people talk about prayer, you know, they, they, they misconstrue certain things. So when, you know, in the Bible, it talks about, um, you know, pray cease never ending and ceaseless you don't you don't stop praying you should always be praying Mm -hmm. people are like well what does that mean like sitting and praying all the time no what that means is being in a state of gratitude and appreciation yeah and you know to go back to this flow state in the zone idea right now that i have the benefit of hindsight and i've experienced it in both you know let's just say burst and then maybe just like even constant, it's hard to explain, but like I could tell you in sports, being in the zone would be, man, dude, I'm not thinking about anything. I'm just reacting. I can see the, it's like it's slow motion. The game, you start to like see before it happens. It's weird. And that just comes from like repetition. It comes from um, lack of fear. It comes from no anxiety. It just comes from like zero stress, supreme confidence in your abilities and you just know, you know, it, it's a weird feeling in sports. In life and business, since I don't get it anymore in sports, um, <laughs> you know, I just I just drop bombs on the golf course. And um, yeah, I, I'm not feeling the flow state in the golf course right now because I'm not that good yet. <laughs> um, but in business and life, I can tell you, I do feel like I'm in the zone in the mornings. So Mm. when I look back at every creative idea I've ever had or every problem I've ever had in my life or business and I needed to solve it, I didn't solve it right now, like during the day at the office. I'm busy. I'm not coming up with new ideas talking to you. I'm just, uh, whatever I already know and and like that's what I have Mm. to offer. But in the mornings when I have time to basically like receive you know, downloads from God, when I have time to actually articulate my thoughts and think through problems and meditate in this quiet time, Hmm. I can synthesize all of the experiences and information that I've been receiving, you know, like tomorrow morning, what will happen is I'll reflect on what we talked about today. And I'll just be like, man, you know, Greg said something interesting. Like, I wonder if I should be thinking about this. And it'll like just naturally happen. And then, you know, all of a sudden, like it pieces together with other experiences and things I know and my belief system and all this. And then, you know, all of a sudden I'll be inspired with a new idea or something. Right. So, you know, any idea I've ever had product, any, I just like all of a sudden it'll just come to me during that time. And then I'll just start writing. And all of a sudden, I think so few people do that though, which is that state of self-reflection of quiet time, which is really, you know, you can call it prayer. You can call it quiet time. You can call it, um, where you're uh, meditating, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, you go back to the Bible again, be still and know that I am God. That's, that's what that really is. It's just sitting quietly with your own thoughts and just, you know, what, you know, what can I be grateful for? What can I be appreciative for? Mm -hmm. And going back to being in that flow state, like as an athlete, it's because you had so much repetition doing it. Yeah. People don't realize most of the things that like thoughts and emotions that they experience are just being repeated over and over and over subconsciously. That's what a habit is. It's your subconscious mind. It's what a belief is. It's your subconscious mind. So they don't practice the state of being grateful. Yeah. They don't practice the state of being appreciative. And if you don't practice on a regular basis, you don't just hop into it occasionally. Yeah. Like if you practice being fearful and anxiety and wor- anxious and worried all the time, guess what you're going to be most of the time because you practice it. So being intentional with quiet time of like, who do I want to be? Who do I want to show up as? How do I want to represent myself? And what kind of things am I supposed to be doing or learning or improving on and just sitting quietly and letting that kind of simmer. That's when I found my, I'm the most creative. I'm most excited. I come out of that, like inspired and like, let's go. And yeah. that's exactly what you're talking about, man. That's, yeah. Well, and the other part of it too is 
it goes back to playing the long game, right? Because, okay, let's say somebody listened to this and they're like, dude, I'm going to start doing that today. I've heard you say 800 times, I'm going to do it today. Now, I, I believe. I'll be like, great. Your life's probably still not changing <laughs> because it doesn't change right away. Nothing changes right away. We live, it takes in, it, look at our society, time. man. Look at our society. Everything needs to happen now. I want to be wealthy now, rich now. I want to be fit now. I want to lose weight now. I want to have my business explode now. Um, you know, last year I was talking with Alex Hormozzi and I was like, you know, my biggest frustration in business is not growing fast enough. And he literally looked at me and laughed. He's like, yeah, that's, that's everybody thinks that, but you don't, you push, you get into that flow of the business and you let it grow as it grows. You know, you put the right pieces in and you take time to sit and think and ponder and wonder and go, what pieces are missing here? It's like putting together a puzzle. You don't just plop it on the table and start jamming it together. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people do. And I did that for over a decade. And it so, makes you worse. It, it makes you so much worse. You stress out, you're frustrated, you're worried, you, you know. I've had the sleepless nights. I've had the cold sweats. I've had the, you know, sitting in your office, like, how am I going to get through this? And it was simply because I was doing that. I was pushing too hard, too fast, expecting results that really weren't happening. It shouldn't have been happening in the time that I was giving it. Yeah, no, it was unrealistic. And I agree with that because as I've grown my businesses, I even struggle to make a yearly goal because I just like, don't really care. I really don't, you know, at the end of the day, I just know if I stay committed to my daily process, I will win. Like, I don't know how long it will take. I don't know when it will pay off. I just know I will win. And that was the approach I took when I started doing content back in 2020. I was like, I know that content is really important. I know it's bigger than people realize. And I know I can be great at it. I know I have all the intangibles. I just don't know when the world will figure it out. Yeah. You know? And so I just stuck with the process every day. Same thing with business, same thing with events. You know, WealthCon was never supposed to be what it is. Mm. It was just eight people in my living room a few years ago. And then every quarter we just kept meeting. And then it became 50 people in my office. Then it was 80 people. Then it was a hundred people. Then it was, oh crap, we got like 200. We, we're going to have to go get a thing. Then it became, all right, well, let's open it up to anyone, not just students. And then it just kept evolving. And this next one at Caesars, I think we might get 2000 people. Wow. So it's like, that was never the plan. It just came from every day doing the right actions, making great relationships, mm -hmm. understanding and listening to feedback figuring out how can we make this better each event and iteration. But here's the thing. The reason it's grown so fast is repetition. Most people are lucky to hold one event a year if they're even able. And then they do it and they're like, dude, selling tickets to an event's hard. I'm like, yeah, I know. They're like, how do you do it every quarter? Well, think about it. You've done one event in your life, two events in your life. I've done now 16 mm -hmm. in the last four years and I'm going to keep doing them. Yeah. Because they're, they're successful and you should keep doing them because they're changing people's lives. But, but, not, but not even that. Like, you'll never catch my repetition mm -hmm. and what I know because I've done 16. Yeah. You, to plan 16 events in that short of a period of time and fill the room and get the speakers and to refine so quickly because you got only got 90 days for the next one versus a year where you're like, all right, next time we'll do better. Like, you are forced into a position of mm -hmm. you're just going to be better than everyone because of repetition yeah. and experience. You know, <laughs> there's people that are watching this now and they either have been to a wealth con or they'll, they'll come to one now and, and they'll have them in their mind. Like, man, I want to, I want to throw one of these. Yeah. And what they have to understand is comparison. Yeah. You've thrown multiple, you know, over 16 of these and it started out as, Eight, eight people, people in the room. Yeah. Yep. Now it's a couple thousand. Don't jump ahead and compare yourself to somebody that's been there and done it for a long period of time. You can model them. You can yeah. figure out where they started from and say, well, that's where I want to be. So where did they start from and start growing that? But you've refined your message so well. You've you've refined what it is and and that it aligns with so many people that are already in your, in, you know, in your database and in your world. Um you know, taking those steps and doing that, the people and that I didn't watching. know what I believed. Just so you know, when I started, it was just like it let it become its thing. Its yeah, own thing. I didn't yeah. know what I believed. I'm like, it was a real. I'm just like, yeah, let's talk about real estate. Mm -hmm. 
like, and as time went on, it became so much more as my belief system of like, oh, people are resonating with this wealthy way thing, mm. you know, like, and it's not that I just went with it because it was like, no, I've always believed that. I just didn't know how I articulated it and why it was different. I didn't mm. realize it was different. I'm just like, this is what I do. I don't know why everyone doesn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> like it makes, it, it makes perfect sense for me. And yeah. they're like, no, nobody does this. And I'm like, huh? They should <laughs> like, <laughs> let me, let me prove to you why they should. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I meet enough guys like you who are successful and you're like, bro, like the way you do it is so different than how, like, I need to know how you do it because I, what I do, it, 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 it can pay the bills, but it, it doesn't give me the other things I need in life. And I was like, wow, you know, it is different. It is unique. And so, yeah, but I, I went to growth con, um, in 2018 mm -hmm. And that was the first event I went to and I saw it and I was already successful as far as the business had go. But like I looked at it and I was in the second row too. And I looked at it. I didn't know any of these guys. I'm like, why is everyone screaming for these guys? Like they're like this big deal. Like I freaking, I've never heard of one of these people. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, and now all these people are my friends, but I remember like Bradley was there and, uh, Pete Vargas and, uh, Maybe he, I can't remember, but Ty Lopez, they're going crazy. I'm like, who is this guy? Mm -hmm. Russell Brunson sold 3 million bucks in like a, a minute. And I was like, okay, like, I don't understand. I think Andy Frisella was at that one too. Yeah. yeah. But, Ed Milet was there. Yeah. And I was like, oh, Coach Burt, who was just at the last wealth Con, was there. I was like, huh, why are people getting so fired up for these guys? They're nobodies. That was my mindset. I'd never heard of them. And I come from the world of pro sports where, like your mainstream famous. Mm -hmm. These people are all like in this circle of fame. niche fame. Yeah, yeah. And like, that's why I'm like, dude, I am not famous. Trust me. Okay. Like if you're, if you know real estate and maybe business, you might know me. Okay. But other than that, you don't know me. So I, but I went to it and I just like heard these guys all tell their story and what they were doing. And as a competitive guy, and I hate being, playing the comparison game, but I, I do it a lot just as an athlete. I'm like, huh? That guy got there. Okay. He's a normal guy. Yeah. Like, see, that's not, that's, a not, that's not comparison though. Honestly, it's not, okay. you're, you're, you're and saying it's not to like belittle them, right? That a lot of people compare and, and go into that scarcity mindset. Like they have that. Why can't I, you're yeah. going, they have that. I can. Yeah. That, that's, that's the difference. It, it's subtle, but it's, it's, that's the difference. Yeah. You're like, well, dude, that guy can have that. That's why, I mean, I've done the same thing. So I've been in some really cool rooms with really amazing people and I'm sitting there, you know, I'll never forget sitting in front of the stage one time. And, and it was uh, one of the uh, events after party events, or whatever. And I'm sitting there watching these people come in and I'm like, that guy has a jet. That guy has a jet. That guy has a jet and he's an idiot. <laughs> yeah. That guy. And I'm like, well, if those guys have done it, yeah, it, it, it brought my self worth up of not comparing and belittling myself like, well, I can't die. It was it's just that mindset of, well, that means I can do it, too. Exactly. Yeah. And that's how I always perceived everything. I was like, huh. All right. And then, like, I had this thought in my head. I was like. I could probably throw this event. I literally thought that like back then and I'd never thrown an event. No social. media. I just looked at it and I was like, I bet you I could do this one day. Like now, look. It wasn't like a goal. It wasn't like, hey, in five years, I need to do this. It wasn't like, hey, I need to speak on this stage one day. I need to be friends with these guys one day. Like that was never a goal. I just looked at the situation and I was inspired and I said, okay, yeah, if these guys can do it, I can do it. And also, I really do think I could do it. It doesn't seem that difficult to do. But that only comes from doing other hard things in my life. So after playing baseball for all eight years, you know, making no money, seeing the top of the world athletes compete at the highest level, getting paid hundreds of millions of dollars. And to know that I could not do it. That was the difference because mm -hmm. I watched those guys and I, you know, I remember the first time I played against Mike Trout, it was in spring training. I was like, no, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. There ain't no way. Like that dude is just unreal. And you see these guys and you're like, no, I can't do that. Like I literally cannot compete or do that. And then you go into this other world and you're like, 
oh no, I can do that. Like that dude. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of self understanding, understanding yourself though. And, and yeah. being okay with that. And you talk about that acceptance, like I was saying, and I think a lot of people battle with that because they're like fighting for this dream and you have to be realistic as well. You got to be like, look, does it make sense? And and when you talk about in, inspiration and, and you were inspired, I mean, that means in spirit. It literally means that mm, I never heard that. You've never heard that. It no, literally means good. in spirit. And so when you talk about the spirit, the Holy Spirit, spirit yeah. of God, when you're downloading that information, you're, you're in that spirit of like, you know, guide me, show me, you know, I'm appreciative and grateful for everything that I've, I've had both positive and negative, which is a really hard state to be in for most people, but being in spirit allows you to go, I'm going to take action on that. It, it, you know, some people call that a gut feeling. Like I just, yeah, yeah. I feel like I just, this is what I need to do in 2020. I did that. Okay. So, you know, the world's falling apart and I have a chiropractic practice and I decide that I want to help more people. I want to learn how to do a business and do better at it in 2020. I transitioned it into a integrated medical practice um, and learned how to pull myself out of it while I was growing it. Mm. And that was a very unique and interesting experience. I had to have an amazing team around me. You know, they're back right now running the business, doing fantastic and they are all aligned. And I had to learn how to do all that. But I remember being in that spirit of like, no one in my circle, no one said it was a good idea. Right. But I'm like, I just, I know, like you don't, you can't explain it. It's just, this is, this is, this is what needs to happen. And I remember my wife and I took a walk and I was doing, um, I had a, a thing online called think and lose weight at the time. I was trying to help people, you know, think about losing weight because really losing weight's not hard. If you think about it from the physical side, you know, there's four things you need to do. Drink water, eat foods that are as natural as possible, do more activity than you did yesterday and sleep properly. Your body's going to start being healthier and lose weight. Then why don't people do it if it's so simple? So anyway, I was doing that and then I was, and then I decided I was going to go all in this, this regenerative medicine clinic thing. And my wife takes a walk with me and she goes, look, and this is great about being on the same page. She's like, you, you need to pick one. Yeah. Can't you, do both. You can't yeah. do both. Right. Pick one. And uh, I did, I picked that and then shut the other thing down for a few years. And then after it was going on its own, then I could go into, okay, now I can do this because this is taken care of with the right people, with the right systems, with all the right structure. And I think people miss that because you're doing so many things and now I'm doing multiple different things, but they skip. They're like, oh, I need to do all this stuff. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. no, you don't. You need to get one solid yeah. And then you can move on. And I test, like pulling myself out, pulling myself out. And it's like, oh, it's still running and doing well. Yeah. Because my team oh, is Oh, it awesome. broke. Let me go. Yeah. Let me help this. a little bit. Right. But yeah, pull out again. And that that's the process that occurs over time. It's taken me, I mean, I've been in business now freaking 18, 19 years. Yeah. And some people will be like, oh, you're really successful. I want to do that. And they're like 21. I'm yeah. like, I get that. That's cool. It's going to take a process. I can help you do it quicker because I can show you the pitfalls and, and learn from my experiences. Well, the problem with the 21 year olds is obviously they want it all quick and then they do get to see the anomaly 21 year olds who did it quick. Yeah. And, um, so and they, they don't realize how small of a percentage. Yeah, they're an really anomaly. Is. Those yeah. are the LeBrons. Like yeah. it's just, no, that's, that's not how it goes. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to do this. Um, but yeah, no, it's true. And I think it, once again, it all comes back to having a long-term mindset, right? Okay. 19 years in the biz. I was telling my, our students this yesterday. I was like, huh, I got my license in 2010. I'm going on year 15 in real estate. Holy crap. I've been in the game 15 years. I didn't even want to be here. <laughs> I don't even really like real estate that much. <laughs> like, I'm like, dang, dude, this is crazy. Um, it's crazy. It's 15 years. And I love that you said that though. You didn't like real estate very much because there's a lot of people that are with the mantra, you know, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I'm like, well, there's a lot of times you have to do something that you don't love in order to get to the next step, get to the yeah, next level. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah. And you might learn to love it. Right. You know, I think, uh, you know, I was flipping couches before this and I loved flip or no, sorry, I didn't love flipping couches. I loved though getting deals. I was like, dude, I actually like getting deals and hustling. Like now, now the couches, they're just the vehicle of getting deals. And then I learned with real estate, it was like, yeah, I mean, whatever houses are. Uh, yeah. When I look at luxury real estate, I'm like, this is tight, but the majority of house flips and wholesale, like it's boring. It's whatever. But I love building businesses and processes. And so, you know, I love uh, the vehicles, whatever, but the love is in something different. And, you know, back to doing your passion 
I got to do that in baseball. I made no money mm -hmm. and you know, whatever. So I am a believer in that. If you're going to start a business, you don't need to love it. Okay. You might learn to love it later down the road, but if you do it right, you can build the business and, and kind of exit it and do something you love now that you have this thing making money. Because if you want to go play golf every day, odds are you're not going on tour and getting paid by sponsors. So you better go build a thing that can sustain you while you go. Yeah mess around and suck. Well, and it's, it's figuring out, I think a lot of people have problems with that is figuring out what they actually want. You know, yeah. if you ask the majority of people, you know, what do you want? They're like, I don't know. Like we, we do a thing in our, in, in our businesses where we talk about personal, professional financial goals. And I learned that from a mentor of mine. And it was astounding to me when I would talk to people about, Hey, what are your personal goals? What are your professional goals? What are your financial goals? They had no idea. They, I mean, zero. They're like, I don't know. Um, pay my bills this month. Yeah. Like there's no ambition really. I'm just like, well, have you ever worked towards that? Like it blew my mind because <clears throat> I was always somebody that was, I'm a visionary person. I like to set goals and just work towards them and be like, well, how quick can I make that happen? And and who do we need to, what resources do we need to find to do that? And I just thought everybody did that, you know? Mm. Like, well, I'll tell you like the way I set goals, I do set goals for the year. So for those who don't know, we actually have um, an app called the Wealthy Way app. And so it is a custom planner that I created I've literally used it for over five years now. Like I built how I wanted to set goals and track my habits and everything. And then I built the app for me and just, you know, gave it to <laughs> everyone else. And, you know, this is, this is how I, I, I believe and I, it's worked for me. But one thing I've realized is I'm not so concerned, like I said, about the yearly goal or the three-year goal or the five-year goal. It's good. What I, I think the thing I look at is I want a general idea of where I'm going. Just give me like the general idea. So an example of this would be like, all right, you know, we're going to California. I don't really know what city. I don't know when we're going to get there or, but I'll know when we get there. I'll be like, yep, that's, that's what I want. Right. So, you know, I have a general idea of what I want. I don't know the time frame, And I just know that I need to head west. <laughs> you know, I'm like, if we head west, we might end up in Seattle first, but eventually we're going to find our way there. Yeah. And that's kind of how I think. And all I just know is I'm going to drive the car just west every day. <laughs> and as long as it's moving west, we're going to get there because that's just like, I just want to get better every day. I don't want the car to now go east because I got scared. That's what people do. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to comfort and let me, you know, just go there. Or, you know what? <sighs> it's actually okay here. I'm in Iowa where it, it sucks, but you know what? The real estate's cheap and, <laughs> you know, I'll just stay here and it's fine. I shouldn't say Iowa sucks because we own hundreds of apartment units that are actually crushing in Iowa. Mm -hmm. But I did live in Burlington, Iowa, my first year playing minor league baseball, and it sucked. So, um, <laughs> so one, you know, you took a whole state, and you're the one. You lived yeah, in one spot. I don't, wanna, whole I don't state. want to trash yeah, the whole yeah, state. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I do. I totally know what you're talking about. Yeah, because like people will settle. The going and never get tough. Get there. You know, you, you you have a flat tire, and they're like, you know. I'm going to stop. This, I will I'm settle good. here. Let's just settle here. Yeah. This is good. Let's, yeah. And that's what I talked about. Settling, man. Like the only failure is quitting, is stopping. That's the only failure in my opinion. Like you can change and redirect. And I love the way you're saying that. It's a very unique approach as far as setting goals um, because you have a lot more of the understanding of where you're, what you want. Like most people don't have that internal yeah. guidance it comes from in. the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you yeah, would know. I mean, yeah, that yeah. in spirit side. Yeah. And most people don't really have that. They're they're bouncing around trying to figure it out. And so it, it's very unique that you have that, obviously. It's it's something that you've practiced and worked on and 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 have faith in. Um, but most most people really don't have that. And so they end up just aimlessly going into life and then they just get confused and basically go, well, I guess this is it for me. I'll just do well, this thing. Either they're aimless or they want to know every little detail. So they're starting the trip in freaking Florida and they're like, all right, well, okay, where are we stopping? How much gas do I need? How much money is this going to require? How quick is it going to happen? Okay. Well, there's like lots of paths I could go. Should we go through Texas or should we like kind of go venture over? Like 
they ask themselves 8 million questions mm -hmm. instead of just packing so up here, the bags. So here's going. what they do, in yeah. my opinion. This is what they do. So most people, they set a target or goal. They learn how to do one and they set a target. And you're, you're taught to do these SMART goals, which is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. And so they try to be as specific as possible. But they put their happiness in that goal, in, in, the, in the end result. And they focus on that so intently that they don't give them the opportunity to change or move adapt. or yeah. adapt. And so what you're really saying is, look... I know that's the direction. So I give myself the opportunity and, and, and give myself the okay to change and adapt as I go, where most yeah. people are like, no, I got to stay on the path. Yeah. And you're like, well, yeah, but if you're on the path and a better path shows up, wouldn't you want to start going down that path? 100%. Right. But most people don't even see that path because I'm on this path. And that's, yeah. And then they put their happiness at the end. They got blinders on. Right. And then when they get to the end, they're like, well, I'm not happy. And then they set another goal and they work towards that. And they're just developing this unhappiness rhythm yeah. where they're like, set a goal, get to it. I'm not happy. Set a goal. And what they have to realize is happiness and why I believe you're so you know content and happy and joyful in, in, in what you're doing. It's in the movement toward. The yes. Goal. I just want to get better yeah. every day. Right. I want a general idea and I just want to make progress towards it. But I, I want to make the most progress I am capable of. So if I try to do something I am not capable of, that's when discontentment would happen because now you have placed this expectation on yourself that isn't realistic. Mm -hmm. So if I was just like, dude, I got to find a way to become a billionaire in three years, right? Like first off, why? What's even the point of setting that? Okay. if I, You got to have a strong why before you make any goal mm -hmm. because when the going gets tough, if the why isn't strong, you'll quit. All right. Now, okay, I just put this expectation on myself. Um, and let's just say I even had a strong why, but it's still just like not going to happen. So I'm now like forced under pressure now because every day that ticks and I feel like I'm not on pace to hit that goal, I have stress, I have anxiety. And I'm like, dude, I'm not going to hit the goal. I'm not going to hit the goal. Mm. You know, I had a guy, um, <laughs> I'm not going to say his name, but uh, he's a successful guy. He's got a, a really great business. And uh, the first time I met him, he's like, yeah, so by 2026, we got to do, uh, you know, $230 million of revenue. I go, what do you guys do now? Oh, well, you know, this year we're going to finish up at uh, 20 million in revenue. I was like, huh? So you're going to have to go like 20 million. What are you, you going to do in next year again? He's like, we're going to do 58 million, 600,000. I was like, where did you get that that's, number? That's a very specific yeah, number. I was like, okay. that, that wow. is really specific. And then the net, he's like, yeah. And then in 2025, we're going to do, um, you know, uh, 126 million, whatever. Right. And then he's like, and then by this day, I, I don't remember what the numbers were, but you guys get the gist, right? It was like some crazy goal that was so ultra specific of what had to happen for the next four years. And I go, so why? I go, why? Like, what is this? What's the significance of this? Mm. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, why do you have to hit these specific numbers every year? And what, like, what's the significance of even this goal? He's like, I don't need to have a why. And I go, huh? Okay. I don't understand why, why now I'm intrigued. I'm like, okay, hold on. <laughs> let's, so, let's talk about this. Yeah. How, how do you not have a why? Okay. Yeah. yeah I'm like, I'm really curious yeah. now because you're obviously successful, but I'm just curious how somebody gets so ultra specific about like years, not just like this year, but like to a T of like the next five years, because these aren't projections. These are, these are like, Hey, the, we have to hit these targets. And, um, he didn't have a why. He was just like, bro, I just, you know, I heard from someone, there was some other famous guys like, you know what? Like, I don't have to have a why. I don't have to justify what I do to, you know, I don't have to justify why I want to do what I want to do to you. And uh, this was oh, our first okay. thing. Okay. Oh, and, uh, okay. No, we're friends now though. <laughs> but it was funny because I was like, no, you don't. But I'm just like genuinely curious of why you, <laughs> I've never seen this before. I'm so intrigued how this came about. Like, uh, tell me about your upbringing. Like, I literally want to know how somebody came up with this ideology. I'm, I always look to the deeper reason of why in people. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was just funny, man. And as we kind of got to the core of it, he's like, this number is important to me because of this. And I was like, it was like a symbolism number. It, it still didn't have a why. It was just like, this number is symbolic because this happened at this time. And I made a promise to somebody like that. I'm like, 
that's dumb, but okay, yeah, okay. whatever. <laughs> so anyways, it was just, a, it was such a funny conversation and we're still friends to this day. So like, <laughs> I will still give him crap, but I, I told him, I go, so what happens to, to the point of having blinders? I go, what if there's a better opportunity? Like, what are you not willing to adjust because you've set your future up the next four or five years? He's like, this is how, this is just what I'm going to do. And I'm like, all right, whatever. I was like, I live the exact opposite. I want to be free and open to whatever God calls me to do and whatever opportunity presents itself. If I feel like the Holy Spirit's leading me that way, that's where I'm going. And I love, and you have a video about that buying, uh, you know, property on top of that hill. And then you're like, well, now I have it listed for more. And I bought this other property now. And, yeah. and, and if you had your mindset on, this is what I'm going to do. And yeah, this I have to live on yeah, this. I have to live on this hill because th that's too rigid and too, sh and that's actually out of spirit because that's not, you're not inspired when you're so focused on that. That's the way it's got to be. In fact, you're kind of like, Argh. you know, it, it yeah. should, it should feel like that, that flow of, um, of just, just being alive and just being you know, appreciative and grateful of that. But the thing I want to make, so everybody understands is that understanding where you want to go is important. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like being aimless is bad. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, uh, I don't know what I want to do. I'm just going to like stay, do nothing. <laughs> right. It's like, well, okay. Like, let's just go. What, what do you think is the worst part of your life right now? Well, I'm fat. All right. Well, let's focus on that. That's the thing. Okay. I'm broke. All right. Great. Let's figure out what's not going to make you broke. We don't, you're, you're, you don't need a big why right now. You have basic human needs that need to be addressed first. Okay. And then you start after you accomplish some things, then you're like, all right, there's deeper meaning. Like what, what, what do I got to do here? Yeah. So I think that's important, but the part like I'm trying to explain with like the California analogy, which I never have even said before. I just randomly came up with it. Um, is that it's the idea of Kaizen where you just want to be an improvement every single day. And when you have, you know, daily improvement as the goal, one of our core values is train daily. Our core value isn't win the race. It's just train daily. Mm -hmm. And so when you're training daily, there is no end. Like the end is just knowing that you trained that day. Mm -hmm. And that you did what you were supposed to do to the best of your ability that day. My belief is if you just do to the best of your ability every day in terms of growing, it compounds on itself. And then you end up at some crazy level knowing that that was the max yeah. of your potential right now. If you start wasting days and you're not efficient and you skip workouts, you skip making the phone calls, you skip making the videos. Well, you know, you're not giving it your all every day. I know I can go to sleep at night, a content man, knowing I gave it my all on just every aspect of my life. I got, I put in a hard workout. I was disciplined with my eating. I, I worked efficient and hard and did things that were going to grow my business in the best possible way. You know, I was intentional with my family. As long as I know I did all those things, I will let whatever result happens. I'll be completely fine with it. It is so unique and it's so impressive. I mean, it really is. That is very, that is so unique. Most people, even people that people watching this would think we're successful are, are, are not. And in fact, in, in your book, um, I love some of the stories and there was a story that I had that was really similar. It was a guy that, um, so I used to write songs down in Nashville. And so I met this guy, he'd won the, um, his lifetime achievement award for songwriting. And he goes to uh, this award ceremony and he wins this lifetime achievement and he has this big award and he um, comes home to his empty table with his empty house and puts his big award there and just starts crying mm. because he had devoted his life to this thing that he now has, but he has no one else around him. He's his kids are gone. His wife is not there and cause he's divorced and, and he just has no one. And so when you think about like, so many people judge success by financial success. They yeah. just like, oh, that's success. No, it's not. Yeah. Success is building a life on your terms. It's it's figuring out who you are. Now, how do you figure out who you are? You have experiences, you pay attention to those experiences, you figure out what you like, what you don't like, and you go, oh, and you start building a life that you enjoy and that you're really content with that no one can tell you that you're wrong. Like if somebody can tell you that, dude, you shouldn't be doing that, and you're like, Oh, you're maybe right. you're right. Yeah. Well, then, then that tells you something. Like you should pay attention to it. Like, hmm. Yeah. Like no one can tell me. They could be like, dude, you shouldn't be doing that. And I'll be like, hmm. 
no, I, I, I believe, I, I believe I should be doing that because I believe it's part of my purpose. And yeah. you know, you're on your hill. I'm on my hill. We see different things. It's fine. It's yeah. okay. I don't have to prove me right and you wrong or whatever. Yeah. And so um, I just want people to listen to that. And I love what you're doing with Wealthy Way because it, it's just, it's just the understanding of figuring out who you are and what is when people talk about living my best life, what is your best life? What does it look like? (laughs) Like, what do you love about the, and and they're excited about and what can you produce in this life that you're, you know, you're, you're excited about doing. So I I love that, that you, you are like that because that, and that's one of the reasons why you are so successful though, is because you figured that out. And I've wish I would have figured it out way earlier and listened to my mom. (laughs) She said, uh, she used to say slow and steady wins the race. Always. She'd say that all the time. Mm. And I didn't ever understand it. Slow and steady wins the race. Just stay on the pace that, you know, you and can for maintain. over a decade, I was trying to go, you know, fast and quick, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> I was the direct opposite. And where'd that get me? I wish I would listen to my mom. Sorry, mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Brian Davila, my partner now, he told me um, we were just randomly at his house talking about it. He goes, we were talking about the Cat Williams podcast with Shannon Sharp and how it just blew up. Mm-hmm. And he's like, bro, you know, you haven't had like a super viral podcast yet. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, you should try and like get, you know, I'm like, it'll happen. Like, I'm not, I don't need it today. Like, it'll happen. I'm not worried about it. You know, like that, it's that mindset of, could I try to force it and like do, sure. But like, I oh, just we could, know we could sit here and argue and fight about something that's really controversial and then, yeah. you know, it might go viral or whatever. Yeah. But is that really what you, what the outcome you're looking for is? No. no. But, but I just know it will happen right. with time. Yeah. Something will happen. And you know, I don't even know why this thought came in my head, but you were just talking about, um, you know, people who, who, who force things. Oh, the guy who, who, who did his, uh, song and yeah, yeah. he had nothing, Lifetime right? achievement award. Yeah. I was just, I couldn't, uh, these two guys popped them. I was like, man, who are the greatest athletes ever of our time? And it's Jordan and Brady. Those are the two. And I just thought about like, okay, Jordan got divorced. Brady got divorced. Uh, you know, people would, yeah, killed to accomplish what they accomplished. But like, you know, for me, I don't know any of them personally, but just looking at Jordan today, I'm like, bro, I would not trade lives with that guy. You know, like he's in, looks to be in terrible health. His eyes are like yellow. He like mm-hmm. is drinking and gambling every day. And like his only fulfillments in golf. And like, I, like I said, I mean, maybe there's more to him that I don't know, but I know people that know him and that talk to him and like, it's a pretty bad situation from yeah. what I hear. But, but, you know, people like when you talk about health, you know, so a lot of people spend all their time trying to earn money, but they give their health. And then later on in life, they try to give their, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But they They try try to buy their health, they try to buy the health back with their money. Right. Yeah. And so when you talk about, you know, I always have the five pillars that I talk about relationships, business, health, faith, uh, or belief and uh, finances. And if you're playing at a high level at all of those, you have a really awesome life and you can have all those things. You don't have to give one up. And I did that for a long time. I tried to put too much effort and energy into one of those things and everything around it started to crumble. Yeah. And if you play the long game and you're content and fulfilled with and, and learning about who you are and you're like, oh, this is cool. I'm I'm experiencing life. Then you don't have to be worried about like, am I doing the right thing or the wrong thing? It's like, well, what do you feel like is the right thing right now? And acting on your highest passion at any given moment, which is what you're doing in spirit. Yeah. Then that's what guides you to a better ending that you probably would not have been able to predict. No, for sure. Right. And so when people look at other people that are successful, what they really look at is all the things that they wish they had that they don't. They're not looking at all the things that person doesn't have. They're only looking at the positives. The, yeah. It's like it's like running a marathon. You don't think about you think about when it, getting done with that race and being like I ran a marathon. That's what's going through your mind. You don't think about mile 15 when you feel like you're going to die. Yeah, that's terrible. There's yeah. no glory. Right. And yeah. you're like, "Oh, well, you don't think about that when you're initially talking about it." And that's the same thing when people compare themselves to other people like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, Michael Jordan's a billionaire. Well, what about the rest parts of his life? You know, billion dollars can't buy your health back. It yeah. can't buy you more time. Yeah. It obviously you know, can't buy your relationship. Okay. Well, I would rather be less financially successful and have all those other things. Yeah. And that's where it goes back to, do you even understand what I guess winning looks like for you? Yeah. And actually it's funny. I just said that because Tim Grover's coming on next week. 
Mm. And, you know, he has the book winning and he coached Michael. Yeah. And everything. I'm actually, I'm going to ask him. I'm, make sure, Austin, make sure I don't forget this question. Okay. Flash it if I forget. Because <laughs> I don't plan. So I'm just like, I, I do want to ask him, you know, obviously Michael gave it all. You know, he just devoted his life to the game. He was, you know, doing all these things and he achieved what he wanted to achieve in sports, but there was a price to pay Mm -hmm. and he's paying the price today. Did he actually win? You know, Mm, it's a great question. You know, in his mind, that's a deep question. He's immortal for what he did on the court. But I would wonder if you asked him truthfully, was it worth it? Does he, was the price worth it? Or could it have been done a different way? Could he have been as great while not, having you know these other things happen i I think and i've i've watched quite a bit of of tim's stuff as well and i think he would say you know the greats pay that price and they they pay they pay a price to to be great yeah but later on in life your perspective changes you know people that's what i'm saying yeah people look back and they go hmm was that really worth it you know with where i'm at now and maybe it is maybe it's not i don't know but knowing yourself like i have a a workout room in my basement and i was able to build it and and above my squat rack i have a little thing up there it says know thyself Hmm. favorite statement know thyself it's because I should constantly be learning about me and what makes me tick. Look inside of you. You know, when you look at the great I am, you know, yeah. when, when you talk about that, that's that's here. That's inside of you. I am. Yeah. The, the statement I am is one of the most powerful statements because whatever you say after that, mm-hmm. you're telling yourself that's what you are. And what's cool about God or the universe or whatever you want to call it, light source energy, the only answer it knows is yes. The hmm. only answer it knows is yes. So when you say I am worthless yes and you believe it internally and you start to act like you're worthless now i love that you are so intentional and you expect to win you're expecting to grow you're expecting it a lot of people expect to lose and they Mm -hmm. don't even know it wow that's crazy yeah but i guess i guess when you've lost a lot throughout your life that it becomes your belief it's a self-fulfilling Yeah. And they'll say, well, I am a loser. I am a procrastinator. I am a, and they just develop this habit of saying, I am whatever. How do you get somebody to break free of this mindset? Right? Because it took for you spending 10 years grinding, going through like. It took a lot of pain. It took a lot of pain and frustration and and yeah. And they, you don't have to go through that. If you really just understand, like there's only four things you can control in life. Only four. Your beliefs, your thoughts, your emotions, your actions. Mm. That's it. So if you really take that and you go, well, okay, start thinking and asking yourself, well, what do I believe? What's true to me? Who am I? Why am I here? What's important to me? And start asking yourself those questions. What you're really asking is you're asking for your purpose in life. And I would call that God within you that lives inside you coming out Mm -hmm. and saying, this is what it is. And you're discovering yourself. You're experiencing life through your perspective. Okay. Okay. So sitting quietly, thinking, asking yourself those questions. And I didn't do that for a long time. I thought it was wake up early, start running, start working out, get going, whatever, and, and push, 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 and grind, grind, grind. And what happened was, is I wasn't present most of that 10 to 15 years because I was constantly either living in the future or the past, I wasn't living in the now. And the now is really what's coming out of you right now. You know, right, now right. is the only time you have anyway. Mm-hmm. You don't have, you know, like you can look at the past, you can look at the future, but you only have now. Right. So knowing who you are now, I think is extremely important. And how you figure that out is you ask yourself those questions quietly. I mean, most people wake up and immediately grab their phone and they are hooked in with their identity of who they believe they are in that moment. And they are just repeating the same program, the same actions, the same habits, the same beliefs. You got a pattern interrupt yourself. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that what's hard for people is that anytime you do that, you grow or change you, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And when it's uncomfortable, you think, well, I must be doing something wrong. And then you go back. It requires faith. And that that this new thing you're going to do is going to actually work. Yeah. Because most people would rather do the thing that they know they hate, but know what it is. 
here's what here's a statement i want you to really think uh, pay attention to so it's easier than you think think about that it's easier than you think okay meaning your thoughts it's easier than you think and we make it harder we think we think things are harder we we have all these past experiences which turned into beliefs which are really just connections this equals that and then therefore i can't because I can't because it's not, it's not for me because, and what you're really saying after that, because is a reason that you, that is really an excuse, but you call it a reason. Mm. So you're, you're making an excuse that you say, well, the reason is I'm like, well, when I ask people that I'm like, well, is that the reason or your reason? Right. Right. And that's a pattern interrupt right there. And they go, what do you mean? I'm like, well, it sounds to me, third party sounds like an excuse. I got a question for you. Yeah. So you're doing some, I don't even know what you'd call it. Would you call it mindset coaching, life coaching? So I, I yeah, life, life, set, life, I try to help people build their life on their terms, their dream life on their terms. Um, what we're really doing right now is we're working with people who are in a business mm-hmm. who feel they're relatively successful, but they feel stuck. Yeah, yeah. And I help them pull out of that like I did in, by implementing systems and learning how to actually run the business. It's something I love so doing. It's a, lot, it's a lot of mindset yeah. and there's also some business operational things going yeah. on. Okay. So we'll link to that down below so people know and can get access to that. Um, but one thing that sticks out to me is um, clearly you're a deep thinker. Um, whenever I get guys who because I'm a deep thinker too. And I don't have frameworks for how I think so deeply. I just, I am, <laughs> I am a deep <laughs> that's thinker who I am. That's, that's yeah. what I do. And yeah. so I just articulate things as they come to mind and I just wing it. But whenever I meet guys like you and I, and I have a few that come on the podcast where I can tell I'm like, okay, they're very deep thinkers. They have clearly thought about why people are the way they are, how, why they act the way they act. And I'm, I'm always thinking about this. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just like, where did you learn? What made you start to think this way and, and, and come up with these frameworks and these thoughts and these ideas and, um, to be able to articulate them? Mm. That's a great question. Cause there really wasn't a moment in time. It's really a culmination over time. Um, part of it is who I am as, as who I was born, you know, my personality of who I was born. I was always kind of thinking about stuff just like, why is that? Well, you're asking questions about things. Why is that? How did that work? What is it? I mean, I remember taking my dad's drill apart one time because I was like, how does this thing work? Yeah. You know? So, I mean, that's, that's part of that deep thinking. Like how, how does this work? Well, when you turn that internally and you're like, well, how did I work? Like, how do I yeah. tick? Um, it's interesting because there was moments in my life that, that these things uh, came to fruition. Like one of the things I have, I do with my students is I tell them to write an asset list. Um, versus liabilities. And I don't mean like real estate assets or financial assets. I mean, assets that of what you think about you Mm. and liabilities of what you think about you. And the reason why this started or this, where this came from when I was 21, um, I met my wife and up till that point, I was very insecure, which you wouldn't think that now you're like, dude, you're on stage and you speak and you play guitar and you sing and you're a business guy. Like, what do you mean? You know, you're on podcasts. But I was really insecure. In fact, my wife would describe it as I was scared of my own shadow. Hmm. Like, and it really was because I was, I was afraid of what other people thought of me because I was afraid of what I thought of me, really. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't realize it at the time. When we, we first met, we were hanging out for like hours and we were talking. And it was just one of those things where the conversation flowed. And at the end of it, she's like, so what's your catch? And I was like, well, what do you mean? She's like, look, you're 21. You're going to grad school. You are going to be a doctor. You, you know, like you seem like you're fit. You, you, you sing, you play guitar. Like she made this list that I was like, dude, that, that guy sounds awesome. <laughs> you know, like I didn't really even realize that I'd never brought it to my attention. And so that was the first moment that I was like, maybe I do have value. Mm. Maybe I, and, and that was kind of the thing that triggered, you know, that internal questioning about, Maybe I do. You know, why have I, why was I thinking it differently until now? How'd that happen? Yeah. And so now I do this asset and liability list and most people, and I, I would have people do that, draw a line, assets, liabilities, write down all the liabilities, meaning pay attention to your thoughts about you. Yeah. yeah. What are all the things? And most people have way more liabilities about themselves than assets. 
And I would guess a lot of the liabilities aren't even really true. Oh, well, yeah. That's just beliefs that you think about yourself or, or that you're worried about whatever other people think about you. Yeah. And they're not necessarily even true. But the point that you have to understand is subconsciously, that's what you are telling you about you all day long, every day. Right. And that what does that sense. turn into? It turns your, into your thoughts, your emotions, your, your actions. Yeah, I, for me, I'm like a simple guy. So it's just like people who have confidence right? They, they have figured out how to do that, right? They believe in themselves. Yeah. People who have arrogance or narciss narcissism mm. see the asset column as just this massive list. Like, I'm so good and there's I'm no amazing liabilities. and I'm better than you because of it. Yeah, they have no liabilities. But a truly self-aware person, you know, can, can truly reach the point of objectivity mm. about themselves and say, these are the things that I am really good at. These are the things I know I'm not good at, and, but they they are true things yeah. that you're not good and at. And it's okay to identify those and yeah. know those. Like, I know there's some things I'm not good at. I am not a good tactician. I am not tactical. I am great at vision and big un ideas and looking at data and, and getting all this stuff together. But to say, here's where we want to end up and here's where we are. How do we get there? I'd be like, uh, yeah. let me hire some people to help me out with that because they will put the things in place to make sure it's operational. I'm not good at the operations. Yeah. I'm not good at the tech. It comes with just full self-awareness. Right. Yeah. Well, I love it, dude. Um, you know, like I said, man, I think it's a great thing for people to, to hear, you know, a, a perspective of a guy who's now been in business for almost 20 years to say, Hey dude, I did the route that they told you to go. And you know, I buckled down and did what I thought was best for my family. And I did it for a decade before realizing probably wasn't the best thing. I could have been doing this way easier if I just mm -hmm. would have done these things. So hopefully you can save people a decade of, you know, I guess beating your head versus, yeah. you know, and, and just to start realizing, yeah, actually, you know what, there's a way to do this even better yeah. and it can fast track some people. Yeah. Now, I mean, that's my whole goal is to take really complex stuff, turn it into really simple steps. So then you can start doing those repetitively. It's the three C's correct action consistently and constantly over a period of time gets you the result you're after and give yourself the grace to kind of go, well, you know, this isn't the direction I'm trying to go. Let's go in this direction like you're doing, which I, I just love that. I'm going to try to be more like that a little bit. And I, I think that's there something I could actually work on. Yeah. That's I love really it. cool. I need to get at least 10 more frameworks because you have at least a hundred. <laughs> yeah, I've heard at least six today. I can so. help you with that, man. Yeah. I, I need, I need fine. a cool framework of like, okay, it's actually, <laughs> but no. Anyways, guys, go follow Dr. Greg, go hit him up on Instagram. We'll link to him down below. We'll link to his coaching and everything else. So uh, go check all that out and we'll see you on the next episode. Peace. Anything you want in business, you can acquire and you can use other people's money to do it. You can wholesale a business and make $90,000 a year for 10 years. There's a big opportunity for an entrepreneur to hoover up lots of smaller companies and knit them all together in a strategic way and then 